All right. Now we're going to talk about Jesus teaches Nicodemus. This is one of the great things about uh, the book of John. This is John 3, verse 1 through 20. John is going to show us Jesus' interaction with uh, different kinds of people. So they, uh, he's going to take us and he's going to show us Jesus' interaction with all these different types of people. And all these first couple, what I, what I want you guys to kind of take a look at is Jesus is going to show us Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is uh, the best of the best. He's righteous. He is uh, not, not in the ultimate sense. But he is a good man. He is a religious man. Uh, and he keeps the law of God. And he's seeking after truth. The best of the best, especially in first century Palestine. And then he's going to take the woman at the well. She's the worst of the worst. Jesus is going to take and tell both these guys essentially the same thing. Nicodemus is not so good that he doesn't need the grace of God, Jesus dying on the cross for his sins, to be saved. So Nicodemus is not good enough. And then you're going to take a look at the woman at the well. It shows us there's no one beyond the reach of Christ. There's nobody so bad that he cannot make you a child of God. So he takes both extremes. And that's what we see here. So Nicodemus, we're told here in Scripture that Nicodemus was a ruler of the Jews. Uh, he's also a Pharisee and a, a righteous man. So basically what Nicodemus is, Nicodemus would be akin to a senator, a U.S. senator in our in our country today. He is a Pharisee, and he's also a ruler of the Jew. Remember, the Pharisees are the most strict sect of Judaism outside of the Essenes, which uh, aren't in Scripture. But the Pharisees, they, they were uh, very pious. They tried to keep the law of God. And they also said that he, he's a ruler of the Jews, which tells us that he's on the Sanhedrin. Now, just because you're a Pharisee doesn't make you a member of the Sanhedrin, all right? And just because you're on the Sanhedrin doesn't make you a Pharisee, okay? But this Nicodemus was one of the top guys in uh, Judaism in Palestine at this time. So he comes to he comes to Jesus at night, and he tells Jesus, he says, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could do no one could perform the miracle, miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. You see, Nicodemus gets it at this point. This is exactly what we're talking about. These signs tell you that the person doing them speaks with the authority of God. That's exactly what Nicodemus picks up on. He says, we know, notice it's the plural, we, so if so it's not the editorial here. Nicodemus represents probably a group of other Pharisees that are coming to Jesus. And they say, look, we have seen your miracles and your signs. And we know that you could not do what you are doing unless you have been sent from God. So Nicodemus gets it. That's where we should be when we look at the miracles as well. That's the reason, primary reason for the miracles that the apostles are allowed to do. Okay? We see that in the New Testament. So he gets it. Jesus says, in reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. So Jesus wastes no time. And we're going to find this out when Jesus runs into all these people Jesus is not big on small talk. He's not going to sit there and talk to you about the weather or about what's going on in politics or any of this kind of stuff. He knows why Nicodemus is there. And so he gets straight down to the issue. He says, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you were born again. Now, he's fixing to say you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you were born of a water and spirit. Don't push that too far. Don't push the seeing and the entering thing too far. 
Jesus is going to say it's it's common in the Jewish culture. We do the same thing too, but he will say the same thing in three, four, five different ways. So he's going to help you get your mind around it by saying the same thing in a different way. All right. So he says. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. That can also be translated born from above. Well, Nicodemus, he doesn't understand what's going on here. So he says to Jesus, how can a man be born when he is old? Surely he cannot enter a second time in his mother's womb. I'm not sure what Nicodemus is thinking here. I don't know if this is a, a, a ironic or a, just a, a quick retort by... Uh, Nicodemus is a very crass response to what Jesus is saying. So his his mind is definitely on earthly things. He, he doesn't. There's no spiritual inclination to what Jesus. I mean, what Nicodemus is thinking right now. We're going to see that too. Not only with this ruler here, but we're going to see that with the woman at the well. Jesus starts talking about her spiritual things. She immediately she, she's thinking, okay, water, well, I'm thirsty. Nicodemus, same thing here. All right, he must be born again. So. Jesus continues his conversation with them. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. All right. So Jesus says you cannot be, you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you're born of water and spirit. We understand spirit. Okay. If you're filled with the Holy Spirit, we got that part. What's the water talking about? <clears throat> well, that's a good question. Scholars are all over the map when it comes to what is the water talking about. Some say it's talking about you have to be born. Uh, the water represents uh, physical birth. And maybe the second verse seems to indicate that. Because, I mean, the second verse says flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to, uh, gives birth to spirit. Maybe. Some people think it is uh, baptism. But remember, if it is baptism, he's certainly not talking about Christian baptism. That doesn't exist at this time. Nicodemus wouldn't have known anything about that. Possibly the baptism of uh, John the Baptist, baptism of repentance, maybe something like that. Uh, some scholars see that in the original language, the the, uh, the article is not there. It doesn't say born of water and the spirit. It says born of water and spirit, water and spirit. So they, they see those things being together, not separate things. Okay, so anyway, all those together, I think it has something to do with uh, repentance. It's obviously not the, the act, the ceremony of baptism, whether it be John's or uh, Christian baptism. We know that, that that's not the way it works. These outward things are point to inward spiritual realities. So, but the point is, what I, what I want you guys to take away from this is... Jesus tells us that, that flesh gives birth to flesh, spirit gives birth to spirit. Okay, you must be born again. The reason why this analogy is so good is because you cannot make yourself born. You didn't, you had no uh, choice when you, or uh, you had no part to play in your original birth other than being there. Okay, you were born uh, by the will of your parents. Here, Jesus is telling you that you must be born from above, from God. This is a work of God. You cannot work yourself up to be born a second time. He's telling you that this is of God. This is not of you. And we saw last time that repentance is a gift from God. You have to be granted repentance. That's what Scripture tells us. Jesus says you cannot be born of the Spirit. You cannot become uh, a child of God unless you were born of the Spirit. And uh, a little bit further down, we're going to see that Jesus says the wind blows where it wills. Okay, You can't see where it came from or where it's going to. He's telling you that the Spirit is sovereign. We see that if you jump back in the prologue of John's Gospel, he said uh, born of the will of God. And he says it in the negative, too. Not of the will of man, not, not of the will of a husband, but of God. So he says it in every way imaginable, 
<clears throat> to tell you that this is a sovereign work of God. The reason why I labor that point so much is because we, in our human nature, we want to hang on to, we want to do a little bit. You know, God's doing 99.99% of the, the job, but we want to contribute that one, one tenth, one hundredth percent. Okay? And we tend to think, especially in, in our evangelical circles, that we almost put faith on the level of a work. Like your faith is something that you did. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. You can't work up saving faith. You can't get all excited enough to become a child of God. No, he's telling you that you were born of the Spirit. You don't have anything to do with it. It's God's work in you. Okay? And that's hard for us to wrap our minds around. Because we want to earn it so bad. But you can't. Okay. So, he says, Nicodemus doesn't get it. He doesn't get it. Uh, Jesus says to Nicodemus, "You're Israel teacher. You're Israel teacher." Jesus said, "Jesus, and you do not understand these things. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and we testify of what we have seen, but you, but still, you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you not, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things?" Next verse, extremely important. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven. The Son of Man. <laughs> Jesus speaks of himself as the Son of Man. Uh, it's his favorite title for himself, Son of Man. And nobody calls Jesus Son of Man. So Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. Nobody else would call Jesus the Son of Man. In the most basic sense, the Son of Man just means a human being, a person. All right? Uh, but there's an added dimension to it. It's it's kind of a, a dual uh, it's kind of a dual meaning here. You could take it that way, but what Jesus is referring to, and here he points it out so crystal clear, is Daniel chapter seven. He's telling you that I am the Son of Man of Daniel. All right. Uh, let me read this for you real quick. The reason why I'm taking time to do this is because. Jesus will talk about this over and over and over again. And it's important for us to get our head around it right at the beginning. This is Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. So Daniel sees a vision. Here's what he says. Here's what he sees. I saw the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. He came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. So you see how amazing it is? Jesus can refer to himself as a son of man and not cause a riot. Because he will speak in this language so if you have ears to hear you're going to understand what he's saying. But if you don't have ears to hear, you're thinking that he's saying, yeah, he's just some guy. Okay? You see that? That's going to play into Jesus' role because what we're going to see here, when he starts out his ministry, the general move is he's not going to be real vocal about his Messiahship. All right? They call that the Messianic secret. As Jesus turns to go to Jerusalem after Caesarea Philippi uh, confession, he's going to be more uh, upfront with it. Okay? There's several reasons for that, and we'll get into that as we go. But I wanted you to see the Son of Man language. When Jesus says the Son of Man, this is what he's talking about. All right. <clears throat> so, John 3 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to, to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the most famous verse in the Bible. <clears throat> Unfortunately, they stopped reading after 3.16. <clears throat> With 3.17, down to 3.18, 
Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. It's not clear in the original transcripts if this is Jesus talking or if this is John's talking. All right. Uh, either way. But <clears throat> so Jesus tells us that you have to be born again. And <clears throat> that God sent his son into the world to give his life that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The last thing before we leave uh, this verse here, this part here is I want you to know, I want you to see that Jesus presupposes uh, the condemnation of all men. It's original sin. There is none righteous. No, not one. That's what Jesus is telling you here. You must be born again. Not most people must be born again. Not you, Mr. Pharisee, Nicodemus, ruler, righteous man. You get a pass. Nobody gets a pass. When you were born into this world, Scripture teaches us that you are D-O-A. If you do nothing, you will perish. That's why you need the salvation of Christ. Okay? Alright, so John 3, verse 22. So Jesus is back around, <clears throat> he's back around Jerusalem, and he's baptizing, and John's baptizing well. So their ministries are kind of overlapped here a little bit. So Jesus and John are both baptizing well. John's disciples, the language is a little bit unclear, at least to me, a little bit here, but the overall gist of this passage is uh, John's disciples are jealous. More people are going to Jesus than to John. And John does what John does. He points to Jesus. Okay? He must increase, I must decrease. That was the purpose that I was sent uh, to baptize. He says, I am not the Christ. I'm the I'm the, the friend of the bridegroom, or I'm the best man. Alright? Alright. So, in this little passage, John tells us that the Father loves the Son and has placed everything in His hands. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for the wrath of God remains on him. In the verse immediately before that, it also tells us that Jesus was given the Spirit without limit. Every other prophet, every other personage in the Bible, was also, <clears throat> all the ones that were spiritual, that were anointed to do a specific task or purpose, uh, they were given uh, the grace, the authority, the power to do what their mission was to do. So <clears throat> Elijah called down fire from heaven. Uh, Elijah was not given the ability to walk on water or do some of these other things. The reason why it wasn't part of his ministry. Jesus is not given the spirit with limit. Everything has been given over to Jesus' hands. All authority. Okay. He's walking in the fullness of the Spirit. So next we're going to get to John 4, 4 through 26. This is the woman at the well. So Jesus is down here with his disciples, baptizing. There's there's an, kind of a conflict or mix up between John's disciples, Jesus' disciples, and um, also the, the rulers of uh, Jerusalem at this time are getting wind that Jesus is starting to build up. There's more people going to Jesus than John. So he's starting to get the, the rulers are starting to get wind of Jesus' ministry and his popularity. So Jesus kind of bows out or, or leaves here. His time has not yet come. Alright, he says that to Mary uh, at the 
when he turns the water into wine. That's an important thing that runs throughout John's gospel. My time, my hour has not come. It's not come yet. It's not come yet. And then when he's headed to the cross, he says, my hour has now come. It is clear that Jesus is walking in the full knowledge or understanding that he came to die. And that's what his mission would be. So, John and his, uh, Jesus and his disciples, they go, they go back up. Uh, they got, they're they headed back towards Galilee. But when they do that, they're going to cut through Samaria, which most pious Jews wouldn't go through Samaria. There were two roads, really. There was a road that went, you see, uh, down here is uh, Judea, then you have Samaria, then you have Galilee. So the Jews, the the ethnic Jews, they would be at the top and the bottom. Right sandwiched in the middle are the Samaritans, right here. All right? So, pious Jews would go around. There was a road that went over the Jordan on the other side of Jericho, went straight up here into Galilee, and then cut over. Okay? So, like the Pharisees and all those guys, they would cut over here, go up, and and then go back into Galilee if they needed to go up there. The shorter route would be go straight through Samaria. They didn't like the Samaritans. They didn't have any dealings with Samaritans, the Bible tells us. They hated the Samaritans. Okay? But Jesus decides to go through there anyway. So when he's going, he goes to Sychar right here. This is the site of, traditional site of Jacob's well. So he goes there, it's hot. He's tired. He sits down at a well, sends the disciples into town to get lunch. While he's sitting there, the Samaritan woman comes up, and he sees her, and he said he asked her for a drink, a drink of water. She flips out. So why are you talking to me? All right, I'm a Samaritan woman, and you're a Jew. Okay, what Jesus is doing here is he's jumping over several social boundaries in one one swing, all right? No respectable Jew, male Jew, at this point in time, would speak to a woman in public, okay? There's some teaching that say it was okay to address your wife publicly, but that's it. Would not speak to a woman publicly, all right? Jews would have nothing to do with Samaritans. That's number two. He's talking to her. Number three, uh, she was an uh, adulterous woman. She was a sinful woman. She had five husbands, and the, and, the, and the man she was living with right now was not her husband. She was living with a boyfriend. Jesus knew that. So Jesus jumps through all four, all three of those barriers. And won just by asking her for a drink. So she freaks out and doesn't understand. Jesus tells her, if you knew the gift of God and who it was to ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. She says, sir, you have nothing to draw with and the well's deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself? As did also his sons and his flocks and his herds. So she doesn't understand. She thinks Jesus is talking about some kind of physical water. He's talking about living water. He's talking about spiritual things. So he tells her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will come in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So now she's interested. See, she's coming out this, the Bible tells us that she's coming out here to, to this well at noon. This is a desert region. She's at the well at noon, which you would not do. All right, It was the job of the women to go get the water okay, for their daily needs. So they would go out to the well once a day. They would get up. They'd carry their buckets and stuff with them. They'd get all the water they needed for that day. And then the next day they would go back. This would be a social event. For them, <clears throat> this would be their Facebook time. Mm-hmm. All the women would go out there together. They would figure out what was going on. You know, who's doing what, who's having babies, who's 
you know, cooking what, whatever. This is a very social event for them. So they would go either in the early morning or in the late evening because it was cooler during that time of day. You would not go out to this well at noon. The fact that she's there at noon tells us that she's an old social outcast of the community. Okay, so she wants this water that Jesus has so she won't have to come start coming back to this well. <clears throat> She says, sir, give me this water so that I don't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to this to draw water. He tells her, go call your husband. <clears throat> she says, I have no husband. Jesus says, yeah, you're right. You don't have any husbands. And you've had five husbands. And the guy you're with right now is not your husband. So Jesus looks right through her. He knows exactly what's going, in her, going on in her life. And... He's come to give her living water, which, you know, we know as salvation, eternal life. But before that can happen, she's going to have to deal with her sin. Jesus doesn't pass over any. She is not out of his reach. No. But he will not let you continue to walk in your sin. That's got to come out. He puts that on front street, right up front. All right? And so when he does that, she says, okay, I see you're a prophet or a holy man. You know, my people say that we should worship on Mount Gerizim, and you say that we should work, worship at uh, Jerusalem. But we know when the Messiah comes, he's going to tell us all these things. And Jesus says, I, the one who is speaking to you, am he. I am the Messiah. Which is interesting because he tells this Samaritan woman straight up that he's the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And he very rarely does that anywhere else in Scripture. And he, he will do it later on in his ministry, but right now, not so much. So what's going on? Why would he tell her? And why wouldn't he just tell Nicodemus straight up? Look, I'm he, the, the Bible says the Messiah is going to come and be the Redeemer. I'm that guy. Follow me. He doesn't do that. One of the reasons that is, is there's so much baggage attached to the term Messiah in uh, Ju uh, Judaism at this time. What Jesus has to do is he's got to... There's two things that they have to learn about Jesus. They're going to have to learn who he is. And they're going to have to learn that he is, in fact, the Messiah. But they're going to also have to learn what the Messiah is, who the Messiah is, and what he came to do. Most of them are looking for some kind of political uh, ruler. Somebody to come in and kick out the Romans and set up shop and uh, rule the world from Jerusalem with power. So he wasn't as forthcoming in his messiahship with more people that had that baggage attached to them. She did. Now Samaritans did understand uh, Judaism in part. They believed in the five, first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. They didn't take any of the prophets or anything after. So they, she knew that the Messiah was coming. She didn't really know that much about him. That's why Jesus tells her, uh, you Samaritans worship what you do not know. We, the Jews, worship what we do know. Salvation is of the Jews. So he's not saying that you can come to God the Samaritan way, you can come to God the Jewish way, you can come to God the Buddhist way, or you can come to God this way. It doesn't matter. You know, that's not what he's saying. He's saying, no, no. Salvation is of the Jews. Salvation comes through Judaism. All right, there is a right way. Uh, one last thing I want to point out in this passage that Jesus says is, He says, uh, God seeking worshipers that will worship me in spirit and in truth. Uh, what He's talking about in that passage is spirit, not as with a capital S, and most of your translations will put a lowercase s here, and that's right. Uh, he's talking about your inmost being. Like when Mary says, my, my soul does magnify you, and my, my, soul, my soul rejoices in you. He's saying my inmost being, my inmost parts. That's what God is after. 
He wants you to worship you, worship him with all of you. Okay? All right. Uh, that's all I got uh, today.